Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by Global Child Forum. Um, we're happy to see quite a few attendees with us this afternoon. And uh, today we will be covering the topic of child participation and business. My name is Nina Folmer, and I'm research manager at Global Child Forum, and I will be the moderator today. Uh, before I present the agenda and our speakers more in detail, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as to um, why we're doing this today. Uh, Global Child Forum um, is a platform for child rights and business, and we stand on two legs. One is uh, doing forums and uh, meeting places for stakeholders around children's rights and business to meet and discuss the issue. And we also do research and uh, guidance to help companies um, take these issues forward. Um, in, at our last global forum in Stockholm uh, in 2018, uh, about a year and a half ago, we introduced the topic of listening to children in different ways uh, at the forum. And we also launched a pledge for children's rights and business where companies can uh, commit to doing something concrete for children in their business. And we saw a big interest from companies around specifically child participation. And uh, we also understood that many are hesitant and are uh, afraid of doing wrong, so to speak. And this is why we started this uh, work stream around child participation, which we have been running since the forum in, in different ways, uh, to try to help companies sort of either start or uh, evolve in their work around children's rights. And this is the first webinar on this issue that we're having, uh, but we're hoping we'll uh, be able to form a series in time. Uh, but it's part of a larger project where we're developing the business case for children's rights and business uh, around child participation, and also uh, produce guidance on this issue. And this is we're doing this together with Tara Collins and Katie Stoll, the researchers that will be presenting a, very soon. Before I move on, um, let's see. No, we'll take the agenda first. Um, so basically today we will have two presentations. The first uh, by uh, Tara Collins and Kate Tistel, who will introduce sort of theory and practice on children's rights. And we'll also have a more practical presentation from IKEA on the corporate perspective on these issues. And the last part of the session will be a Q&A where you in the audience will have the possibility to ask questions to the presenters. And you will have this uh, possibility throughout the presentations. So you can use the Q&A function, which should be in the bottom bar of your um, window. You click on that and there you can post questions. Uh, you can pose them either anonymously or with your name. And you can also vote for each other's questions so that we can see which ones are the most popular. So please make use of this function throughout and we'll try and address as many of the questions as we can in the Q&A uh, part today. And then we'll uh, close around four o'clock Swedish time. It's about an, in an hour. Uh, but before we start, we just wanted to uh, gauge the experience in the audience today. Um, so we will uh, publish a very quick poll that you will be able to see on your screens now, uh, where we would just like to understand sort of what your previous experience with child participation in business has been. So you have four options there that you can just click on. Uh, very quickly, um, just to understand also for the presenters uh, where, where we stand today as a group. See voting going on, that's excellent.
I think almost everybody has voted soon. Um, so we have nobody with extensive experience, it seems. Uh, a few with some experience. Um, but most seem to be in the sort of familiar or unfamiliar with the concept. So thank you for answering that. And now I want to move on to the presentations. So the first presentation will be um, by Tara Collins and Kay Tistel. Uh, Tara is the Associate Professor in the School of Child and Youth Care at Ryerson University in Canada. Her professional experience spans across university, government and NGOs. And her research interests include child and youth participation, protection, play, business and rights-based approaches. Kate Tistel is the Professor of Childhood Policy at the, let's see if I can get this right, MHSES University of Edinburgh. And her professional interest lies in promoting children and young people's participation rights, working across fields such as sport, data citizenship, family law, and education on this topic. And in collaboration with children, young people, and adults, she has undertaken this work within the UK and with cross-national partners in countries such as Brazil, Canada, Colombia, India, and South Africa. And Taryn Kay will introduce uh, a child participation perspective in business decision making. They will talk about some of the challenges and the different ways in which child participation can be implemented by companies. Please, Tara. Hello to everyone. Uh, we're delighted to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us and thank you to Global Child Forum for organizing this excellent webinar and the uh, wonderful colleagues that we have as part of this experience together. And it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, explore the pledge that Global Child has to calling on companies and partnerships to advance children's rights in business. And specifically, pledge number two, listen to children acknowledges the importance of listening to children who are impacted by business and listening to their views uh, in the decisions that affect their lives. This is a fundamental child rights um, consideration and so we're very delighted to be exploring it with you here today. I just need to move forward to the next slide. Okay. So for our short uh, presentation, uh, we will, Kay and I will be discussing four essential uh, elements. What is child participation in business? Then identifying some common challenges. Thirdly, then we will provide some potential directions for uh, participants to consider. And then we will conclude by going through the nine essential requirements for meaningful participation. Now, children's rights and business is part of a larger global discourse that's been happening around business and human rights. Some of you might have heard about the RUGI principles, also known as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, um, the Children's Rights and Business Principles. Uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has uh, produced a general comment to provide guidance on state obligations with respect to business and children's rights. All of these documents have been developed and reflecting the human rights principle of participation. So it is important for us to think about how business um, uh, can undertake, uh, can consider uh, participation in relation to its practices. But some of you might be wondering, how does business affect children's rights? And there are both positive and negative influences. It could be such things as harmful exploitation, such as sexual exploitation has been discovered in, in some dimensions of the tourism industry. Um, business also can play a part with respect to providing access to education, rest and play in the communities in which they work. Um, the attention, for instance, to children of migrant workers and the necessary um, parental supports that are important for pertinent employees are also really important uh, in terms of uh, employee retention and uh, recognizing the roles of children in the lives uh, of, of the communities but also of the people who work for your businesses. 
children also have a play a role to play with respect to product safety and environmental practices as the uh, children's rights and business principles outline so these are just a few of uh, the many ways that business affects children's rights and now we'll turn to uh, participation and Kay hello Kay Tistel here can I just check that you can hear me yes, yes. Tara thank you yeah. well I'm Lovely to have you all here virtually on such an important issue. Certainly, children's participation is a really major and increasing issue within the children's rights field generally. You may know that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most ratified of all the human rights treaties at an international level. And it was really revolutionary in many ways about putting forward a number of participation rights for children and young people. And those range from the rights to receive and give information to freedom of expression and assembly. And perhaps the most well known is Article 12, which is the right of children to have their views being given due regard in all matters affecting the child. So it's very wide. Well, but what is the definition of participation, which is sort of the phrase that gets used in the field? Article 12 itself doesn't use the term, so we find the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, they did a general comment on Article 12, and they gave this definition you see on your screen in terms of what it means in terms of uh, children's human rights. That it's about ongoing processes, including information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect, and in which children can learn how their views and those of adults are taken into account and shape the outcome of such processes. The general comment is very detailed and thus very useful uh, and to consider generally. Um, it recognizes that children have the rights to participate both as individuals and also collectively. So today we'll be particularly looking at the latter and how should and how they can uh, be participating within and with uh, business. Great, next slide. So there's a great amount happening worldwide, uh, policy practice legislation in terms of children's participation. But within that have come actually quite a familiar list of challenges. And despite uh, it being in very different, say, cultural or social economic context, again, quite a similar list despite, um, of course, some differences. So just to capture some of them, hopefully to get us thinking, for example, there has been concern, there have been challenges about children being involved, but it being tokenistic. And that there's a lack of feedback often to them about what has happened with their views, what decisions have been made, and accountability in that regard. Too often children are only consulted quite late in the day when basically the agenda is set and the decision's pretty well made. Uh, and again, that can flow into tokenism rather than being the dialogue and the mutual respect that's foundational for Article 12. People find it's not a problem of finding children who are interested and able to be involved in giving um, really important viewpoints, but rather that too often the adult processes and structures exclude children and young people, and thus the views are not taken forward. There are crunchy issues about who to involve. Are we expecting children and young people in some way to be representative? Uh, what about children who are not involved? Who are the children and young people that rather consistently are not included? And the other side of that are some children consulted over and over again on the same topic. Certainly the young people we work with can get very frustrated at the short-term nature of some projects with sustainability being a real issue. Well, if those are the common challenges, those of us in the field have been interested about how we can get beyond them. Um, and that comes to the next slide. And here's some ideas um, that we uh, gleaned from uh, the wor work worldwide that may be useful for businesses to consider. The one is moving beyond uh, consultation. Uh, to consider about the, the power of involving children and young people in the agenda setting in itself, in terms of dialogue with real exchange between decision makers and children and young people, rather than those polite nods and pictures uh, being taken. 
the value of being involved in identifying the solutions and not just the problems. Given children and young people are all too familiar with nothing happening, um, we found from experience the advantage of certainly quick initial feedback. And children and young people I work with one in two weeks and at most four weeks about what's going to happen. And to consider having a quick initial win, something they can really see quite quickly is being changed, um, has found to be very, very powerful in establishing that relationship. We find that children and young people can and do understand if something is not possible, if it's explained well and with respect and they're in dialogue. But if adults say something is going to be done, is it? And that comes to the accountability issue. Third point, um, children of course have busy lives in whatever context that they do live in, raising a whole number of questions to consider, like what are children getting out of our invitations to have them involved? Are we going to pay them, at least pay back their expenses or loss of working time? What about the developing their skills personally, perhaps a meaningful accreditation? So really thinking about, you know, what are children getting out of um, their involvement that we're asking them uh, to participate in? Thinking about timing, you know, are we thinking about what times children and young people want to participate when they are available to? What about children being able to opt in and opt out given their busy lives? Recognizing relationships. If children are engaged over a bit of time, um, which does tend to be more productive, then we need to think about issues about trust and fun and even more uh, consider about ethics and safeguarding issues. What about children aging out? So sometimes children and young people become passionately involved. So how do we think about as they stop becoming uh, children after the age of 18? What do we think about that? How are we thinking about renewal of the participation activities? What about who to involve? I would suggest first, and maybe you'll come back to it, is thinking about why children or young people are involved and actually going from there in terms of who should be involved. What is the issue? What is the question? Um, and think which children and young people might help. Um, you might want a large number to be demographically representative. Or actually, we're increasingly finding how um, useful, productive it is on, for everybody to think about children and young people having particular expertise um, and coming on as advisors about child-led research that in turn may reach out further. We have found recognizing children as generators of knowledge, um, really changing around the power relationships uh, in terms of children and participation again very productively and addressing that adult side. I think the last point on that slide to emphasize is as I'm saying, uh, there actually are wonderful partners who engage children and young people in amazing ways. So it's not really a question about children and young people being able to participate. It's more the question whether the adult individuals and the adult systems are ready for this. Um, and actually spending as much time ensuring that the adult side um, is prepared for children and young people's participation and, and is going to engage with it uh, is, is a key aspect of the solution. So over to you, Tar. Yeah. Thank you, Kay. And just, oh, there we go. We've got this next slide now to offer some ideas of how children's participation can be incorporated into uh, businesses and their activities. So in terms of uh, one idea, the, uh, picking up on some of the pieces that Kay just shared with you, it is possible for instance, for a business to set up an advisory committee of young people to advise on particular aspects of the business. For instance, in relation to corporate social responsibility, um, or as uh, Children's IKEA has done, and we'll learn a little bit more in a few minutes, how uh, young people advise in relation to product development. Another option is agenda setting days where young people can help set priorities um, in relation to children's rights that business may want to focus on. So for instance, one uh, I, example is the company Telia that had a board meeting with young people. There's also the option of involving young people in monitoring and evaluation. 
where uh, certain aspects or many aspects of business activities can be evaluated, assessed to determine how um, the, the business is affecting children's rights and how children's rights can contribute to the business. And the children's involvement should be in relation to issues that are important to them. Complaints and accountability. Now, the idea of accountability is important to young people uh, in order to respect um, the definition of participation that Kay described earlier. And these mechanisms are important so that we can hear what a young person or young people um, uh, are saying about how the business is affecting them. And it's important that this be accessible, not just to a particular child or a group of children, but we have to pay attention to the fact that children are very diverse. And so are we recognizing that diversity and making, providing the supports necessary for these mechanisms to become available? So for example, a grievance mechanism in a local supply factory in Bangladesh was particularly helpful and accessible to children. Lastly, we have the, um, the other direction of when a particular business change is proposed, a child rights impact assessment should be undertaken. A famous example is by the travel company Kioni in India, which identified how children's rights were affected by their travel uh, activities, how, for instance, cultural um, dimensions of the tourism upon the local communities hadn't been really appreciated before the impact assessment was done. And so bringing young people into that imp impact assessment is a very informative way of ensuring sustainable and respectful business practices. So those are a few ideas. And while we think about ideas that might be applicable to one's particular business, I think it's important to consider the nine requirements uh, from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And these were identified in the general comment that Kay uh, shared a little bit from uh, earlier on in this presentation. This is where the definition of participation comes from. But this particular general comment is very helpful in identifying the considerations, the requirements in order for participation to be effective and respectful. And so the first one is transparent and informative. So this means that any activities that are undertaken to engage young people, they must be clear and provide the necessary details, also offer the potential for learning for young people and this information is really important for young person or young people to make an informed choices as to whether or not they want to get involved and this relates to the second principle of well, that any participatory activity must be voluntary. Young people cannot be forced. They have, to be cho they, ha they have to have the opportunity to choose to participate due to their interest and they cannot be coerced. Necessarily then, participation must be respectful in accordance with uh, children's rights and human rights more generally. That young people must feel that they, are, that they are being treated with dignity, that they are valued and not belittled by any process that engages them. Processes must be relevant, which is the fourth requirement, as you see on your screen, where young people see the connection between the activity and themselves, and that they understand and know what is going on. The activity must also be child friendly. What this means is that it needs to be accessible and understand, understand by the participants, so that the language used is not too high level or too complicated, it must be meaningful to the participant, and that processes and activities must um, make sense to the participants. We also must be at pay attention to any uh, inclusion, that diversity of young people is valued, and that the process doesn't exclude other young people. Participation must also be pay attention to training. Participation requires training. Um, as as uh, Kay pointed out in the last slide, adults may need to be supported by training so that they can understand what participation in, involves and how it can be respectful. And that efforts and processes should not be happening in isolation. 
eighth, the eighth requirement is that uh, participation must be safe and sensitive to risk. Young people should at no time feel uncomfortable or unsafe due to their involvement in, a, in a, an activity. And whether there's a variety of considerations, including one's gender or race discrimination, that, that would be very problematic in terms of participation. And lastly, the requirement of accountable. It's important that young people feel that their contributions are being given due weight in the language of Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that our processes and activities are responsive to the contributions that are made by them, and that they're not ad hoc and collecting views and then nothing happens. A lot of young people that we have worked with uh, express a lot of frustration about participation where there's great intention, but then no follow through. So it's very important to respect um, the importance of, um, it's very important to respect the accountability dimension as the ninth and final requirement for participation. And so we have come to the end of our presentation. We want to thank you very much. And now we turn over to our IKEA participants. Thank you, Tara and Kate. That was very insightful. And as Tara said, we will now turn to IKEA, um, who say, for example, that children are the most important people in the world. So we'll hear about how that works. Um, we will hear from Julia Olofsson, which is the Global, and hum Global Human and Child Rights Manager at Inca Group, which are operating the IKEA retail in 30 countries. And she, there she leads the work on integrating the children's rights and business principles across the company. Julia also has a background with UNICEF Sweden, supporting companies on respecting children's rights in their operations. Uh, Magnus Tuveson is insight leader in children's IKEA um, and is responsible for all the activities where the company involves children in their product development processes. And Magnus has, among other things, worked on building a competence center containing knowledge from experts and children, frequently involving children directly. Uh, Julia and Magnus will provide a corporate perspective on child participation and speak about child rights at IKEA, how IKEA view child participation as a key element and part of their strategy and roadmap going forward. And Magnus will share some practical examples of how they work with child participation today. Great, thank you, Nina. Let's see. Uh, and thank you for inviting us to share a bit about our experiences with child participation. The IKEA vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. Uh, and, uh, and we see children as a key to achieving that vision. Like Tara mentioned, we affect children in many ways. And we, we know that they are a key stakeholder for us as members of the community where we operate, as users of our products, as family members of our coworkers, and as future coworkers and IKEA leaders. And so our point of view on children's rights is that we always strive to act in the best interest of the child. And this has sort of been an ongoing work for many years of defining what does children's rights mean to us and where do we want to go. But this has been this sort of guiding star for us. And um, this is what we will talk a little bit about how that relates to our child participation work today. And then, as Nina mentioned, in our sustainability strategy, People Planet Positive, we've committed to integrating a child rights perspective into all of our business activities. Going forward, we will focus on three areas. Um, protecting and siding with children whenever and however they need us. This is all about strengthening our safeguarding practices across the company, but also about actively involving and listening to children. We're currently exploring how we can bring the voice of children and young people even more into our decision making uh, beyond the work that's already happening, which Magnus will touch upon shortly. Our second commitment is around the prevention of child labor and supporting young workers. This commitment is about ensuring that children have the right to a childhood and that we do not accept child labor. 
But we also want to do our part in working together with our suppliers and supporting decent work for young workers by providing appropriate learning and working opportunities whenever that's possible. And then our third commitment is to inspire and enable children to develop through play. Um, we want to create a global play movement around the world that emphasizes play as something vital for every child's development. We do this through our range and through our stores, but also through the work of the Real Play Coalition that we're a founding member of. And then before we uh, dive into some of the more specific examples of child participation, I wanted to take a moment to mention child safeguarding as that's what we see as the foundation for responsible child participation. We have a zero tolerance policy for abuse, violence and exploitation when it comes to our engagement. Uh, we've developed an internal guideline on participation and safeguarding for all IKEA co-workers and business partners that are involved in engagement activities with children. This guideline has been developed together with external experts on child safeguarding, uh, but also um, working with concrete examples of how we are engaging with children in our local markets around the world. The guideline is accompanied by a training so that before any engagement activities take place, we want to ensure that the adults participating know how to meet and engage with children in a respectful way. Uh, we've, this is something that was started with our uh, product development teams, uh, but we are rolling it out to relevant functions now across the company. And this is really about ensuring that all children that we meet are respected, safeguarded and protected when they are interacting with us. So that's a little bit about just our thinking uh, around children's rights and around child participation. And now I will let Magnus talk a little bit more about the specifics on how do we actually do it. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Magnus Stevenson and I, I work for Children's IKEA. Um, and uh, I am now talking to you from a very small town called uh, Elmhult, south of Sweden. And just to explain how small that town is, I can say that it, it has only one and sometimes two taxis. And then I'm talking about actual cars and not companies. So, but this is also where IKEA once started and uh, it's still uh, where all the products are developed. So the lifestyle here is that we live on the countryside most of us and we go to work, we meet people from all over the world and we, we then try to furnish your uh, homes. And the product development company that I work for is called uh, IKEA of Sweden and then Children's IKEA is a department uh, and we develop products for children and their families. It's not only toys but uh, changing tables, wardrobes, beds and uh, so on. So already from, from the start, when uh, Children's IKEA started somewhat 20 years ago, we had some really high ambitions and a few commitments. And two of them that you can see on your screen uh, shaped the assignment that I got, uh, which uh, started a few years ago. Because before that, we've always said that we, we create products based on knowledge and that we do it from a child's perspective. However, the way of doing it and our tools and working methods changed over time and was uh, never really systematic. So I then got the assignment to do something about this and to level up and to take these commitments seriously. So what we've done from the acknowledging uh, part is that we've created a new networks of scientists and researchers, but we, we also realized that we, we truly need to understand children's wishes and dreams in, in other ways than just to bend uh, down and sit on our knees and try to, to see the world from, from a physical point of view of children. So we, we, we felt that we needed to take uh, child participation seriously. So what we've done is that we have created two initiatives where we interact with children. So one is then called Kids Lab and the other one is called Kids Panel. And uh, the kids panel is uh, online and we interact with uh, children in the age of eight to 14 in different countries. I will get back to this a little bit more. And then uh, the kids lab is where we uh, meet children in, in groups and uh, discuss and get valuable inputs uh, that uh, then affect our decision uh, going forward in the product development uh, uh, processes. 
and the kids lab we've been doing so far in Elmhult, uh, this little town that I described, and Shanghai, uh, a little bigger city in China. So I'm going to change slide. Yeah. Looking back, uh, we have realized that we 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 kind of underestimated the complexity of, of uh, working with children. Uh, when when we started this work, we just uh, we kind of said that this is something we can start immediately and uh, just go ahead and meet some children. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, at least from what we learned, that is uh, kind of how we felt it was done. Uh, so it was. Uh, the legal and ethical aspects is, is one thing, but uh, also uh, within such a big um, company, you have uh, cultural differences in, in the way we view children and, and how we view childhood. So on top of all the safeguarding routines, we have set together a small workshop that um, everyone that wants to get involved in the activities must attend, as Julia mentioned. And this uh, ladder then, uh, uh, is something that we we use to discuss how high we will uh, we will come in in the specific uh, uh, workshop or kids lab that we are planning. Uh, we have realized that we will need uh, an, uh, an IKEA version of this because it's too many steps, and we tend to only discuss what actually uh, tokenized uh, mean. Uh, also, very few being native English uh, speaker. But it, it does its work, and we uh, we have a few examples where we think that we have kind of uh, made it, to, not, maybe not to the top, but quite high. So this is uh, uh, a project that we've been running for a few years now, and it's actually a, a sketching competition. And then we do, there is a little bit of, uh, not, it's little, we, we get some favorites from each country, and then we do some kind of selection, what will be producible or not. And then uh, we decide uh, this year it was five winners. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about from the designer. Who, uh, he is Darren, uh, who made this uh, beautiful rainbow. He's five years and he's from China. And he, he, his comment to his design is like this. I like to draw cars, airplanes and robots, and I love rainbows. It can get cold in the sky, so Rainbow Kids has warm socks on his feet. Such a wonderful thing to think about the rainbow's cold feet. And the uh, happy monster, um, the little monster it's called here, uh, but Thomas from Greece, he says, my happy monster wants to hug everyone around the world. I hope that this uh, little monster will help all children sleep snug so that they don't have scary dreams. So this is then this project is is sort of uh, designed to to uh, um, to take children into the development process, but we want to do it uh, on, on as much of our range as possible. So this is one of the earliest kids lab we did, and it is also an early kids lab in the process, because uh, uh, usually or sometimes at least we have prototypes to test. In this, this case, we did not. We just knew that we were going to do some uh, uh, new play range, and it was uh, we had some rough ideas about that it could be connected to food and uh, and kitchen. So this is then uh, where we used the existing range, and we met quite uh, small children, so we needed to do it in, in a in a child friendly way um, and and discuss whether they cooked at home, and we got some good input on how to to for instance design a new kitchen, which became the outcome of it. Um, and the next one, I won't be able to speak very much more about Kids Lab, but the, the other uh, in, initiative we have is then the Kids Panel. And uh, this is uh, in three countries. And uh, it's a good way to get uh, fast and international input. And since we're working with the same children, we also have the opportunity to get back to them. So uh, the team, for instance, the team working with children lamps uh, did then a sprint process together with the children. So starting with asking the children uh, for um, their favorite lamps, uh, or they browse the web and they post it and, and uh, they send it through this uh, app. Uh, and um, I, I might add, because we do this together with the research company, so they, uh, the children don't see each other's uh, answers and, uh, and all interaction is uh, being done by 
professionals. And that's the same thing when it comes to kids lab. We always work uh, together with trained, uh, for instance, teachers or, or other people that have, uh, they are the one interacting directly with the children. And they also help us phrase it in a way that is uh, uh, understandable to the children and engaging. Uh, so back to the LAMP, then, uh, they, they gave us uh, a good uh, kind of um, mood board on LAMPs they liked and we asked them why they preferred it and uh, it was about feeling safe at night, being able to set moods and, and tweak and personalize it. So then we, gave the, we put this together as a brief and, and gave it to a designer who came up with uh, a few uh, sketches and we sent it out to the, to the children and then they got to um, give reviews on the designs, but also vote which one to go for. And then we, the children got to, um, uh, got to decide. So we went with the, the one that cost, got the most uh, votes. And then I was also, I think I've done it a little bit already, but um, I was asked to, um, uh, to speak a little bit about the challenges. And I think I, I I started to say that we kind of underestimated uh, how complex and multi-layered this is. Uh, but then also along the way, um, I think that if it, it could be a problem uh, if you start, if it, the one who takes a decision, they underestimate it, and then you go on and try to do it, and then you, you kind of get bumps in the way. So I think that the, the biggest risk and the biggest challenge is that you could then sometimes feel tempted not to do anything at all. So it could, I mean, it's not at all hard to set up a workshop and interact with children, but if you want to do it responsibly, it becomes much more complex and multi-layered. So then a, a risk would be that the people taking it seriously will, uh, will come to the conclusion that they won't do it uh, because of the complexity. And, and then the, the companies that does it without thinking about the complexity will be the one who carries through. So, uh, but we have we have carried through. We we we, we meet um, we meet challenges every day. We work with it, uh, but we feel that we have a foundation to work on, and we've done some uh, we've done some work. And I think that you you should never uh, compromise on the safeguarding side. But when it comes to the results you get, and you can uh, and the methods, uh, you you will get results you didn't even expect. So the most important thing is to start interacting with children because you will learn and develop and you will see things from a from a new side so uh, for children's IKEA this has been a, a true success and the, I have one more slide which is hey do it's Swedish I think a few of you understands it's uh, goodbye it's not goodbye yet but uh, our part of the presentation is at least uh, over Thank you, Magnus and Julia. And um, so this moves us into the last part of, of the session, which is the Q and A. Uh, and we, I see that we have a few questions already, which is great. And maybe sort of building on on what uh, Magnus ended on in terms of um, sort of benefits. Um, I see here that we have a question about, um, let's see, uh, about the key benefits of child participation. And I was wondering maybe if, if Tara Kay could give us some one or two practical examples of, of uh, organizations that you have seen or, or uh, been in contact with who, who could sort of present a business case like the one that IKEA has and maybe from a different sector, if that is possible, to show the variety. So uh, I'll, I'll start with that, and Kay, feel free to jump in here. Um, absolutely, there's a lot of uh, detailing around a business case uh, for children's participation. Um, such uh, considerations include, for instance, um, avoiding a large staff turnover due to um, consideration of issues that uh, some staff members and their families are experiencing if children's rights are taken into account, um, for example. Um, 
the, if a company takes, uh, takes children's rights and includes children's participation within its processes and, and activities, um, it could lead as well to uh, attracting higher quality staff to the organization. Um, which is really valuable. Also, the, the improving the greater um, employee commitment uh, because of the, the societal values of respecting um, children's rights can um, be very valuable. And if you engage with young people through, for instance, um, uh, product development or uh, assessing uh, how the business is affecting the community, including young people within them. For instance, it can also um, lead to better risk management, less uh, child rights violations, and less negative uh, media attention as well. Um, also can reduce, for instance, production costs if uh, potential impacts, for instance, through child impact assessments are taken into account and mediated before um, a decision is, is uh, implemented. It can also improve brand recognition, uh, brand reputation, I should say, um, and also makes a business, I would argue, better informed about their communities and the various members of their communities um, and support uh, engagement and sustainability. Um, so those are some of the ways that there is a business case for participation. I've also argued in some of my acad earlier academic work that in addition to a business case, I think there's a lot to be said for our moral case as well, given that the importance of children's rights uh, internationally, but also uh, in terms of the obligations we have to respect uh, young people and their human rights. So those are a few thoughts. Perhaps uh, if anyone else wants to jump in to answer that question. Otherwise, we can end it there, whatever you think. Thank you, Tara. Um, it's really great to hear sort of some of the, uh, some of the benefits that this bring to different companies. Um, on that sort of continuing um, on that note and looking at what people seem to be most interested in here is how how to identify which children to include and uh, what groups they they should represent in terms of age and demographics and i would like to ask magnus this question how how do you go about this uh, in your work i think uh, so far we, we haven't come really far in this we have in the guidelines that it uh, should be and they uh, uh, it should be inclusive and that uh, everyone should be able to attend and so on I mean, the, the small selection that we do is then uh, depending on, on age, and it's more about the product that we're testing and, and which, which target group it is. But I can say also just to have it in the guidelines that, that actually challenge, uh, challenges us, us because when we, for instance, do the invitations, we always have a, a question to the parent and if there is, is anything else we need to know to meet the, the child in a, in a, in a best way. Uh, and that will then give us a few answers sometimes that we, I think it might have been at least tempting to exclude some children uh, if we did not put it on the paper and sign it off. So I think that the, in these cases, the guidelines actually is steering us. So it's, that is then about the be, being inclusive, but the selection from a more uh, methodology or research perspective, we haven't really, really come uh, that far and, and I mean uh, we, we do it in Elmhult which is very specific some of the children we meet they say like um, uh, when will this sale start and I think it would be more commercial in pink because they are very <laughs> they are very they have IKEA co-workers at home as well so at least that we have tried to, to address by uh, opening it up, up and, and have other children than the, than the co-worker than the ones of the co-workers. So we still have we still have a lot to do in this uh, when it comes to this perspective. Thanks, Magnus. I think maybe uh, Kay can fill in a little bit about the theory and methodology here on how to uh, engage with this. Would you please, Kay? Yes. Yeah, so and what great questions everybody's asking. I suppose I would suggest, and Magnus was alluding to that, is taking that step back about um, if you're initiating the participation, what is it for? What is the issues? And actually then thinking about which children should be involved you know and when you're thinking about that then bringing in of course the issues about 
not unduly excluding some or discriminating against others. But I, I think that's a key way to think about it. Which children and young people do you need to involve to help you address that question or address that issue? Thank you, Kay. Um, so if we move on, I think in something connected to this um, that I hope Julia might be able to start helping us answer is how how can you find sort of how do you train employees on this? And maybe connected to that, I also saw another question about uh, how can you find training to learn more about this if you want to start, if you have any tips there. Sure, I can at least uh, try and give a little bit of uh, insight on how we went about it. Uh, for us, I think it, there are two parts to this training, really. One is really looking at child safeguarding across the company, and then one is specifically focusing in on these engagement activities that we do with children. Uh, and Magnus, feel free to add in on that specific part. But on the, on the overall safeguarding is uh, training. We've identified, we went through an internal work where we identified what are the relevant functions that either come in direct contact with children today or come in direct contact with children. Um, so we've done, we did that. We also then invited external experts. So we've been working with UNICEF, uh, who has come in and provided that sort of framework around how do you do child participation and what are the important things to think about. But then they, we also invited them to challenge us on our safeguarding principles and our safeguarding routines. So I think it's good. One is you need to have that internal engagement and understanding of why we're doing it. But then it's always good to team up with experts. Uh, one, to challenge yourself. But then also second is that it's it's always good to bring in the, the outside perspective um, on, on what are the important things. Then we did specific training, uh, and that, that was sort of the overall general training for people uh, that we expect to work in this in their functions. But then we also had specific trainings for people that are running the kids labs, for example, uh, which my missus talked a little bit about. And all of this was based on quite a lot of research and, and discussions, both internally, but a, a lot with external experts. And they're based on the nine requirements um, that Kay showed earlier on meaningful participation. And if, is it okay if I quickly added in something? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Kay here. Just um, the advantage of many of our questions about thinking about local partners, I think you're talking about UNICEF was a really useful partner. Yeah. I think often I'm looking at that question too about involving, you know, parents and children wanting to accept your invitation. And I think that value of local trusted partners that you work over time who have those really good contacts with the children, the parents and their trust, that kind of partnership um, and sharing of expertise and issues can make a difference. So uh, that's how I would work. When I work in Brazil, I'm working with local community organizations that have that relationship with the children and the parents and will be there after I leave. That was my contribution. Yeah, I, if Tara here, I would also buttress that point. It is really important that uh, in whatever context you're working, um, whether it's head office or in uh, various uh, countries of activity, that there are a range of local partners, uh, whether it's local schools or um, local de community development organizations, um, academics, others, uh, um, and young people themselves themselves who are very active leaders can support uh, as well as engaged in the community can play a part in that and I think uh, in terms of the the question that was raised around the gatekeepers que uh, question as to how do you uh, inform and and bring um, the gatekeepers of young people on board with any particular a particular participatory activity. I think it's um, it's about working with with the local organizations that really really help, but also stressing the benefits of participation not only for the business but importantly what do young people get out of it uh, as well and we can't take they can't dismiss that it's very important not only in terms of respecting uh, children's rights uh, and their right to participate but also um, 
young people, it's been uh, described at length in the literature as evidence that young people increase their confidence, their skills, their learning about processes and about society, respect of others. They like to serve the community. They like to meet other young people through such activities. Um, the opportunity to influence decision making. I'm sure the examples that Magna shared, um, how thrilling it would have been for those two young people to have their drawings be subsequently manufactured to allow young people to avoid the scary dreams in their sleep, for instance, and to better appreciate rainbows uh, in, in their day-to-day -day life. So um, it, it supports civic responsibility, among many other things in terms of citizenship and the like. So those are just a few of quick examples and benefits of, of, of participation for the young people themselves, since we've ta already talked about the benefits for business. I'll stop there. Thank you. That, it, it's a really important point, I think, to also speak about this, how, how it benefits both children or youth and, and the business. It's not a one-way street. Um, and I think we're starting to run out of time, but we have time for one more question, I think. And uh, we have one here that I see we have not been able to get to about... Um, and that's a question directly to IKEA about how you consult children in your human rights due diligence process. And I'm thinking here, it looks like a supply chain uh, question. So maybe it is for, for you, Julia. Yes, thank you. Uh, we don't today. Um, Children's rights is one part of the human rights due diligence process that we do, but we do not consult directly with children today. It is something that we are looking into, of how do we do that in the best possible way? Um, but as Magnus also mentioned, this is something, the work that's been happening from the product development side uh, has given us a lot of insight and lessons. And now we need to look at how do we take those lessons learned uh, and transfer those into other processes uh, that we have within the company. Great to hear that we all we all can learn and develop. Um, even though IKEA have come far far on this, there there's always things to to improve on. Absolutely. Um, I just I think it's time to wrap up. If there is any question that we have missed, we will make sure that we try and answer it in a summary that we will send out to all of you participants. Uh, I think during next week. So um, we make sure that everything is, is covered, even though we didn't have time right now. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing their experiences and their knowledge about this, and also to you in the audience who uh, had such great questions and kept the conversation going. Um, we will send you an evaluation tomorrow uh, which we hope that you will help us answer, as that will help us uh, to improve, as this was our first attempt at this kind of uh, a webinar, and we would appreciate your thoughts on what you liked, uh, what you liked less, and how we can get better. Um, so I think we will end there. Uh, thank you all very much, and we wish you a pleasant evening or rest of the day, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you and bye.